in Strasbourg, what he did is he took these motors, the second generation, put on different uh, monomers, used click chemistry to make a polymer network, and then he can wind, actually like a spring, he can wind using light to spring the material, and you can see he can contract and expand, and recently he published that it's completely reversible, so he can take a piece of plastic here, you can contract, expand, contract, and expand, depending on you radiate with light. So, we built these motors on surfaces, we built uh, them in liquid crystals, we put them to polymers to control polymer helicity, this is what we try to pursue as a kind of, of uh, uh, swimming uh, system. So we use here the motor as an initiator to make a polymer and it controls the polymerization, but also the helicity of the polymer. And we build these nano cars. And I want to today to show you a few examples in the last, I think I have, 10 minutes left or so, I will show you a few examples of what we did. First of all, these liquid crystals. We all know what a liquid crystal is. In your smartphone, in your laptop, in your liquid crystal display at home. And we also know that these are often rod-like molecules, like these cyanobiphenols. And when you dope them with a the gyro dopant, you get a helical organization. So instead of being organized like beams in the river, they're going to have this helical organization. And when we dope them with a gyro motor, you see we have modified the motor a little bit by putting here a phenyl group that helps to get a very good helical twisting power. That means the extent to which you make this helical structure. And you need only a tiny amount, less than one weight percent. Why is this so important? If you want to make a color pixel in your display, the Bragg reflection of the light if it's blue or red, is depending upon the helix. If you have a short helix, it's blue reflection. If it's a longer helix, it's red reflection. So what we do is, with this motor, is that we irradiate, it changes the gyrality here, it changes, expands or contracts the organization, and you can make color pixels. But what is more intriguing is this. My students took the liquid crystal material and made a very thin film, a micrometer thin film. So this is the soft material eh, that is behind the screen in your, in your uh, mobile phone, for instance. There's a little bit different composition, but these are the liquid crystal materials that we get. This is typically for such a doped liquid crystal material. So you see this, this, this structure here. These are like waves on the sea. It's soft material. This is the motor, it's only one nanometer, and we have a glass rod swimming on top of it. This is micrometer, and it's 10,000 times the size. You don't see the motor, of course. And here, I must admit, I, this was quarter past five on a Wednesday afternoon when the students came to my office and said, Ben, you have to come to the lab. We want to show you something. Is now a couple of years ago. And this was a decisive moment, one of those moments in your career that you never forget. Because they showed me, yeah, and I could not speak for five minutes, honestly, simply because for the first time in my life, with the naked eye, and now hopefully the movie works, I saw this. So this is what they showed me. Just by switching on the lamp, and it starts spinning and it spins in a unidirectional sense. They also could take the enantiomer, spinning it in the opposite sense. And so this was an amazing moment. And you see here the color changes, the surface architecture of this soft material changes, and the object moves autonomously with the energy from the light. Now, this is, for us, an important stepping stone to make responsive soft surfaces. And we use that now for various applications. And we are really excited about this to pursue this field. 
What happens is, most probably, is that these rod-like molecules, they unwind or they wind, the surface tension changes, the surface architecture <coughs> changes, and you can even rotate a micro-object. We also build these uh, motors on surfaces, and we have been working on that for 15 years, uh, putting legs, putting a rotor, a stator, an axle, a rotor, building them on surfaces. And initially, we built these systems with uh, tile groups, taking advantage of the beautiful work of George Whitesides and all these people that put, eh, you can click molecules and self-assemble on gold surfaces using tiles. But initially, we miserably failed. And the reason afterwards, you know, always know it, but the reason was that these tile groups were very, uh, uh, how do you call it, directly connected more or less to the stator part. And so when you have these molecules then on the surface self-assembled, your energy level, yeah, in the excited state, it crosses the energy, the thermal level of your gold, and you quench your excited states, and the simply the system doesn't work anymore. So what we did is, we lifted it up, we put longer legs, we put some grease in between, you lift up the whole system, and then suddenly it starts to work beautiful. So we built this uh, Dutch uh, design, uh, even when we were part of Spain in 500 years ago, I think you appreciated these windmills <laughs> that the Dutch <laughs> built to keep uh, the feet uh, dry in the low countries. Uh, we still can admire them. Now we have modern windmills, by the way. But I, I thought we built a windmill park at the nanoscale. So this is one billion times smaller. They all self-assembled on surfaces. This is on gold. That was our initial design. But now we have them on quartz and on many different surfaces, you know. And, uh, and they all move in the same direction. Now, we can do all kinds of tricks. For instance, you see here a tripod. You see here a motor that is an axle, which is now more or less parallel. You see here uh, a fluor, a per fluor group. If this is sticking to the outside world or is sticking towards the surface, that changes the thickness of the layer, as you can see, but it changes also the uh, size of the, the, the hydrophobicity quite a lot. And on purpose, we put some fluor groups here to make the effect bigger. And we can change now the, uh, the uh, contact angles of droplets, etc. So this is a stepping stone to make responsive surfaces, you know, and people dream of self-cleaning surfaces and, and so on and so forth. But the main reason we did this, and this is what I want to share with you today, is for the following. We were really fascinated by the ATPAs that I showed you before. And these gentlemen, already 20 years ago, took the ATPase motor, used his tags, put it on a surface, put a long actin filament with a fluorescent group, and then when you feed it with ATP, you can see it spinning in real time. And this is absolutely, I think, a fab fantastic experiment that they did in those days. But of course, they had the advantage that they had a motor from Mother Nature. And we had to make it from scratch. So we had to learn how to build these on surfaces. That's what, just I, what I told you. But now we had also to build long fi fi uh, filaments there and fluorescent groups. So we had to build molecules of this type. And I should cut a long story short in few of the time because we made several designs. We failed also several times. But uh, finally, we made this with tripods that we put on glass coffer slips. Here is the motor. Here is the, uh, the, the, the rod. Here is a robust fluorescent group, because initially what happened is we had the fluorescent group, not this one, and it was bleaching already before we could see the motor rotating. And uh, then we made the design where the rod was not long enough, and you can imagine what happens. The energy, either the fluorescence is there or the motor is there because they quench, you get energy transfer, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Ultimately, uh, I think this is a 29-step synthesis. It's a, it's a kind of a total synthesis, you know. But we could make it, and we could see it rotating. We just published this with wild field fluorescent microscopy. And thanks to Johan Hofkens in Leuven, who is really an expert on doing this deep, deep focused uh, polarization microscopy. And we can see, actually, the dipole rotating. And we can follow precisely, you know, how the molecule behaves on the surface. And so this is now where we, where we stand. So we have for the first time seen now a single molecule making rotary steps in a unidirectional sense. Now, we also decided to make a nanocar. And this story comes from when I got the Spinoza grant uh, 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. And I discussed with my students, what are we going to do? Because you have to go to the ministry. And then 
in an, uh, there's a ceremony and the minister then asks you, what are you going to do with this money? So you have to give a small presentation. And we thought, okay, uh, my, my we were discussing this. And my students were always jealous of these engineers that go to Australia for the solar car race. This was in September again this year. Eh? But we are not engineers, we are molecular engineers. So we thought, okay, we cannot do this, but let's build a nano car and let's build a four-wheel drive. So you see here the four wheels, it's, it's a billion times smaller and it should move over a surface. And I told my students, okay, you cannot go to this because we cannot build such a car, but if you complete this, yeah, then you can go to a conference in Australia. <laughs> now, the first gen a PhD in Groningen in uh, Holland is like here, I think, four years. So the first generation never made it, unfortunately, because it took us seven years. So it was the second generation students that completed it. And so we built uh, this uh, frame, we built the wheels, and uh, of course it's not about a nano car. People think this is about a nano car. It's not about a nano car. What is the scientific question? The scientific question is how to convert rotary motion into translation motion to see it at a single molecule. And this is what we did. And here should be the mo motion, but I don't know why it doesn't work. This is the nano car, and this is an important message. Because this is a modeling of how it works. It moves over the surface, you know, when we energize it. But you see here, due to the wheels, it's lifted up a little bit. And I think that was really important for the success. Because when you have a big aromatic molecule, we all know they stick to surfaces and they never move unless you push them or so. So here they are lifted up a little bit, but also the movement is different from the movement of a car on the road. Think about the mo motors in your muscles. Eh? When you, there are millions of these motors, they work together to make this possible. And they are proteins and they walk. The protein motors in your body, they walk. And, and so this is more or less what uh, we think that happens, at least when we do modeling, that it walks over the surface. So that brings me to our latest design that I want to share with you. And that is, how can we synchronize motion? So more than one motion. And again, the system is very primitive. But we thought, if you have a man on the moon, we all know it faces the Earth always from the same side. Eh? That's, it's locked motion. And we thought, can we do that? And so what we did is we built these systems where we have these motors and we have these rotors here, bi aerial rotors. And the whole idea is, that if we go through this four-step cycle that I showed you before, that this red rotor part is sliding along. You see, it's sliding, yeah? It's sliding, it's sliding, and when it goes from here to there, it slides along the axle, but with the same face, always, the red has always the same face to the black stutter part. So when it rotates, it should be synchronized so there is no free rotation here, but it should always be with the same face in a concerted, synchronized motion. And that worked out beautiful. So this is the system that we designed. Again, it looks a very primitive system, but it's our first stepping stone towards synchronizing motions. And of course, it's very crucial what the barriers are, because it should be flexible. It should change conformation. Look here. It changes conformation. It's not static. It has to move but it has no free rotation so that you have to compromise the overall rotation. It should be synchronized. So this is where we stand now with our synchronized motion, and this is a stepping stone towards more uh, uh, complex uh, functions. Now, my final story I want to share with you today is about a question that I often got, and that is, this is all beautiful, these photochemical driven systems, but in your body you have enzymes and there are catalysts. Can you do a chemical catalysis and make something rotating in a unidirectional sense or controlled motion? And I will show you one case of rotary motion and one case about linear motion. This is a biaerial, a hindered biaerial, with uh, two stereochemical elements, two stereochemical elements, the biaerial and the sulfoxide. And when you have two stereochemical elements, you have the po po possibility to go into a certain direction, because there is a bias, of course. And so we thought, what would happen if we would rotate by chemical catalysis, taking advantage of palladium-2 and palladium-0? And I will explain you briefly how we did it. 
So the basic idea is the following. You have this molecule, here is the projection along this axle. When you have C, B and A, and B and A are not connected, you can see you have rotary motion where B can be away or close to A. But when they are big enough, we all know B are real rotation, it's hindered. Yeah, you have stereoisomers, there's no free rotation. But thanks to Professor Brinkmann in Germany, we know that if you bridge B and A, you lower the barrier and you might get by a real rotation, helix inversion. So the idea was, if you take a metal, metal one, you bridge these, you might go through the plane, and you might go from here to there. Then you unlock by taking away the metal, the B might move away and bring the C close to A, and now if you use a different metal step, it might bridge again, it might go through the plane, and then when you take away the metal, yeah, you are here and you are back at the original state. So the whole idea is, can you take advantage of these metal-mediated steps to go through a unidirectional rotary cycle, taking advantage of the stereochemical elements and the catalysis? Does it work? Here is what we did. We take this, this compound, take this sulfoxide as a directing group to do CH activation to make this intermediate, and indeed it flips through the plane to go from here to there. The equilibrium goes in this side. We reintroduce the hydrogen, then we do a palladium zero mediated insertion in the carbon bromide bond. Again, we have bridged it. The equilibrium shifts to this side. We install the bromide again, and it goes back, and we are through a cycle. These are the steps. I show you one of the steps. Here is the insertion with palladium zero in the carbon bromide bond. We could crystallize this. We have the intermediate. We can go from here to there to there. You can see we can go through the cycle to the other diastem. This is one half of the 360-degree cycle. So we did it also in the complete cycle, stepwise, and we can go through the whole cycle from one complete round. Of course, the yield was still low, 90%. It's still stepwise. It's not fully catalytic. Yeah? But we have proven that you can go through the cycle using palladium 2 and palladium 0, CH activation and CBR activation. So we have a palladium redox cycle, we can go through the cycle. The, the big challenge what we are working on now is to make it fast, continuous and autonomous. That is really catalytically fueled. We know it's possible, we do it stepwise, but we want to make it continuously moving, of course. Now, my final example, ladies and gentlemen. Can you make something moving by a translational movement, like we did with a nanocar. And so, there again, I was challenged, and I discussed with the students a lot. People said, ah, this is all beautiful, but what if you want to move something in your body? And we said, okay, we might use light, but you know that has also some disadvantages. What would be a fuel in your body? We thought about it, and then we said, oh, there's plenty of sugar. So let's try sugar. And then we want to use chemical catalysis to decompose sugar and make a kind of a submarine that moves autonomously. And this is a cartoon, of course. So what we did is we took a carbon nanotube and we put synthetic catalysts, manganese complexes that decompose, for instance, hydrogen peroxide very well. Or we took, in this case, two enzymes, glucose oxidase and catalase. And here is the nanotubes that are glucose oxidase and catalase in a 9 to 1 ratio. And it converts glucose, generates hydrogen peroxide, then the catalase decomposes hydrogen peroxide. You see here in black the oxygen bubbles. These are the nanotubes. They form these tiny spiders because I don't know how to prevent them from aggregation. So they aggregate and form these tiny spiders. But what you see here is under the microscope, no cheating, it's simply water with sugar and nanotubes. And when you put the sugar there, you see they propel autonomously. They convert sugar and ultimately generate oxygen. You see the bubbles? And it propels autonomously. I don't have to touch. As long as there is sugar, they move. So this is an autonomous moving system. Of course, it's extremely primitive. And you people might say, this, this guy, Fehringer, what is he doing at the university? Playing all the time, you know. <laughs> what is this for nonsense? But now think back 100 years in time. Think about how we are able, maybe in the future, to control these movements. 
yeah, to go from A to B, because we work now on Janus particles, and several people in the field work on this kind of <coughs> systems to make controlled movement and transporters, etc. Maybe in the future we will have nanorobots. I'm not, I don't know, maybe it's science fiction. But at least we can make the first steps. So will we have nanorobots that your doctors here in Oviedo will inject in your blood vein in the future to detect a tumor cell or to deliver a drug or do a tiny repair? Will the surgeons of the future be these tiny robots? I'm not sure. I think in 50 years from now it would not be strange to predict it. Eh? When our chips become smaller and these devices, etc. Uh, the best way to predict the future is uh, to invent it. And this is what we together do. We and all the young stars that are here amongst us. So I, today I talked about the art of building small to go from programming molecules to responsive functions to motion, ultimately to dynamic systems. I focused on switches and motors, but you see the perspective here, although this is very fundamental and several of the systems are still extremely primitive, you can think about information systems or responsive materials, smart surfaces, I showed you an example, or self-healing materials. I, I expect in the next 10 years we will have the first examples of commercial examples of self-healing materials. This field is developing very quickly in polymer chemistry, for instance. Delivery systems of precision therapeutics or adaptive catalysts, I didn't talk about catalysis today. Roofing sensors, maybe soft robotics, uh, we have to invent it. And chemists will be at the lead. So I couldn't have done anything, wasn't it, for all the talented students that were in my group in the past year. So this is a picture of the last four or five years. And uh, Valentin came from Spain, and you see other Spanish uh, people here. Uh, I'm really uh, grateful uh, to them, because these were the young stars that make it all possible. Their creativity, their hard work, sometimes you realize it took us seven years sometimes, you know, to make something working. It was a lot of synthesis, a lot of physical measurements, a lot of hard work. And I couldn't have told here anything, wasn't it, for these bright young people. And of course the funding agencies, because of without money you cannot do anything. So thanks to them. But uh, let me finish with a message to the young people here. And that is, I go back in time to Leonardo da Vinci. This is one of my heroes, my absolute heroes. And he told, or, uh, he told us 500 years ago, when nature finishes producing his own species, man begins with the help of nature to create an infinity of species. So for the young people here in the back of the audience, imagine the unimaginable. And uh, to finish again with my, uh, one of the heroes here, you see here, Professor Belenga. And I think he is one of the heroes, not only of Spanish chemistry, but certainly of European chemistries and, and chemistry in the world. And I, I would like to pay homage to him. This is, these days are a celebration of chemistry. I heard so much beautiful chemistry here in the past days. And I think he would have loved and joined with us this beautiful celebration. As I mentioned before, the senior and the junior Fandanas are here. And it gives me great pleasure that uh, Dr. Van der Naas was trained so well on the development of cascade reactions of physocarbene complexes and their application of organic synthesis. I didn't discuss any aspect of what he did in Groningen because he worked on, on catalysis, organolithium chemistries and asymmetric synthesis, beautiful work, but in view of the time I have to stay with this. I was also amazed that although I knew that Professor Balenga had a very broad scope of chemistries, yeah, including the Balenga reagent, he, he was also in heterocyclic chemistry. He published this book, and on the cover you see these nice rings. And that immediately reminds you, of course, of the nice rings of Fraser Stoddard and Saint Pierre du Vage and so. So he was uh, probably well ahead of his time, you know, to see this, uh, this vision. Thank you so much for the hospitality and everything. Thank you. So it's wonderful to be here in Oviedo at the chemistry department at this celebration of chemistry. It's a real celebration of chemistry and it would be fantastic if Professor Balengua would still be with us because he would enjoy so much. The reason is that we see all these young people here, the young stars of the Spanish community presenting their fantastic work. I enjoyed so much during these two days. You see the senior established people, but in particularly the younger people. And if pa Professor Balengua would stand up, he would stand up for the young stars, the young people who are going to shape the science in this country.